I came to China, it was end of, or end of the 70s, 1979. And this happened to be the very first days of the opening up of China, open door policy. And it also happened to be the very first days of uh, contemporary art in China. So let me begin. Uh, this is actually what I found, end of the 70s. This is the socialist Chinese realism. This was program, content, and style at the same time. Uh, this is a very famous painting. It shows the whole code of the socialist realism. The idea at that time was art must educate the masses and paintings have to be in a way to motivate the masses to tell them fear about the agricultural population helping to build the new China. The code demands there must be a child, there must be a woman, there must be an elderly person, there must be the army, and uh, they sh have to show enormous enthusiasm. And this is really what art was about. Now, in 79, this is the very beginning of contemporary art. It was a big rupture. It meant that the artists who previously had to do commissions by the government, who were not allowed to do anything other but the socialist realism, could move on to do autonomous art, choose their subject, choose their style. So what I found at that time was actually a derivative of Western art. The artists had to sort of practice what in our part of the world students were already going through in their education. Uh, they had to start with this painting, for instance. This was a painting shown in the very first exhibition of so-called contemporary art in China. And it caused enormous discussions. You know, how could somebody show such figures? They are much too long, these elongated figures. That doesn't exist in nature. That kind of dispute was there at the time. There was a lot of this art. And actually, in hindsight, completely wrong. I didn't collect it at the time. I was looking at the Chinese contemporary art scene with a Western eye interested in the forefront of Western contemporary art, and I just couldn't find it. That's what I found. So yes, I studied it, but I didn't collect it at the time. Here we make a move, second half of the 80s. By that time, the Chinese artists had found a language of themselves, had found to themselves, um, had adopted, had assimilated, Western art language, Chinese art language. Still, they were contributing to, in their vision, help develop this new China throughout the 80s, comparable to the Soviet realism, uh, Soviet constructivism of the early 19th, early 20th century. And much of the art, like this painting, for instance, was of that nature. This artist, critical about Mao, this particular work shows Mao as the official portrait demands it. The official portraits, eight official portraits of Mao were allowed at the time. And this matrix was defining the image so that in the whole nation, the Mao uh, images would be the same. And here, of course, the artist puts the frame on top of the artist, on, on top of Mao, which then indicates to us one, either we or him are behind bars, etc., etc. So you see the language becomes not anymore a derivative of Western art, but it becomes highly political. We make another jump into the 90s. That was after 
1989, Tiananmen. At that time, the artists uh, were after a short window of time where they had come out of the underground, pushed again back to the underground. They were very um, resignated, negative about the perspective of China. And here we see this young, bald-headed, it's actually the artist himself, viewing this old China resurfacing again. And this is the art which made Chinese contemporary art known in the West. It was this particular part, the cynical realism, cynical polit-realism, as it was called, which found a way into our auction rooms, which found a way into our exhibitions, which uh, was mainly chosen by Western curators to represent Chinese contemporary art. This is another example. This is actually the most accomplished Chinese artist in terms of market. Uh, last year, a painting changed hands for 24 million US dollars by him. It uh, <laughs> shows you where the market had gone in the meantime, starting in the, in the 80s from hundreds of dollars, a few hundreds of dollars, then towards end of 80s to the $1,000 or $2,000, and then around the year 2000 to the 10,000s of dollars, to the peak in 2008, where paintings would make millions, and artists who had never, never anticipated such a development became very rich overnight. This shows more of this political pop, which uh, again is the preferred medium of or preferred language of Western curators, not equally popular in China. Actually, this painting could not be shown in China today. It's uh, Chairman Mao. It's derived from a very famous photo uh, and that photo showed Chairman Mao visiting the farmers in this era, Shaoshan, and the painter added the that time president, Jiang Zemin, on the left, and Deng Xiaoping, the maker of the new China. And it was the Time magazine who chose this particular painting to be the cover of 1999, 50 years of People's Republic of China. And th this shows another type of misunderstanding quite frequent in the West. They felt this is a very positive painting. It shows uh, yeah, these laughing people. It shows all the leaders in the painting. They did not realize that it shows President Jiang Zemin on the left with this steaming teacup actually as the driver of, you know, like in the position of a driver with his tea. And we have the two really important people sit there and chat to each other. And uh, so this particular magazine had been um, seized and was not allowed to be distributed in China. So that's another facet of Chinese contemporary art when seen in the West. Here, Towards the end of the 90s, we come to a period where consumism has reached the Chinese society, and the artists start to uh, thematize consumerism. A lot of these images may remind us of people like uh, Warhol, etc. Of course, the Chinese artists by that time knew about Warhol, knew about Western art, uh, but it's not to be seen as a copy or anything of uh, our kind of pop art. It's more that the Chinese society had entered that stage, which our societies had gone through in the 60s and maybe early 70s. So we see more of that type art. Performance also entered the Chinese art scene. Uh, we see here the artists throw this red pigment in the river. Representing, but it was Ai Weiwei before, right? 
No, this uh, art is called... No, the, the, the Coca-Cola one. Uh, yes, this one. Is it's important to say it's a Weiwei because perhaps today it's one of the most famous Chinese artists, right? That's true. Yeah, he is the best known artist outside China while he's still facing very difficult situation within China. More performance art. Actually, this is the work of a woman. She was the first one to deal with the environment, which today is a huge topic in Chinese uh, society as well as in Chinese art. She collected this water of this local river, froze it, and then had the inhabitants of this village clean their own water while it's melting. Photo also, uh, of course, became a medium of the choice of Chinese artists. Uh, here, the artist selects very old photos, this cool class, 73, and then he tries to find the same individuals and puts them in an image uh, 30 years later. And one can not only read the individual life stories, maybe, of these individuals, but they also represent very much the way the Chinese society has covered in this time. Here is an image about script calligraphy, where the artist covers his face with the calligraphy. We see more such works that deal with calligraphy. Uh, we, over the last few years, have seen a turn of the Chinese artists towards their own tradition, uh, uh, something in imaginable in the 80s when the artists were very much enamored with the Western conceptual art and uh, really disregarded their own tradition. By now, many of these artists have been disillusioned, disappointed by Western concept and have turned back to their own tradition to find new inspiration. Uh, some discovered just a corpse and turned away again. Some discovered a beautiful dream and turned away, and others uh, really found <coughs> new ideas, new concepts uh, to do more work. Here's another artist. This is another school we find very often in Chinese art. Actually, it's the wife of the artist Ai Weiwei. It's a 40 meter long <coughs> ribbon, so to speak, where she sat down every day for a full year and start to paint these small squares, black ink squares. Uh, so this work represents one year of her life. We see a lot of this type of meditative work in China. This is a very strong school which kept throughout the ages and still popular today. Uh, this is another work of a situation where the thousand-year-old tradition meets our uh, Western industrial age, which overpowered China throughout the 80s, 90s, of which I was part of in one way or another. It's 132 Neolithic vases, 5,000 years old, and they are about one-fourth of them covered by white industrial paint, destroyed or painted over, or however we want to consider. It's that very split attitude of the contemporary artists to their tradition. <coughs> Here's a work about landscape painting. That's the other pillar next to calligraphy of Chinese tradition. And so these topics uh, very much resurface in today's art. But revisited, right? This is bodies. Yeah, these are, of course, uh, <laughs> Uh, bodies manipulated um, in Photoshop, whatever, uh, to represent the Chinese landscape, which uh, again has to follow a certain code. There must be the fog, the the the, the emptiness. There must be uh, the, the imposing mountain, etc., etc. Here's another artist uh, focusing on 
mean aesthetics, taking uh, <clears throat> contemporary topics, but putting it in a very different language. This is the same artist. It's again a Ming chair. It's like an explosion drawing. So the artists work with all kinds of media, all kinds of ideas. Um, and in that sense, they have really reached uh, very much, say, the, the format, the language, as we may find it in here, as we find it in our institutions, Kunsthalle, etc. So, these are a, uh, a few works to look at. Maybe no need to comment everything. No, but it's, it's nice, it's huge, and it, it shows a large range of choice that yeah. you have done. So, all kinds of objects, all kinds of materials. <coughs> this is a highly political work. It, uh, according to the artist, shows that power today is exerted by uh, the office, by the bureaucracy, uh, maybe by business people. You see all these torture instruments uh, that uh, is represented in these objects. Uh, it's all kinds of guillotines and knives and torture instruments. And so, uh, according to his view in today's China, uh, it's where the power is exerted, but also where the power is exerted upon. But this shows some other issue very prominent for a while in Chinese art. This is a work made by human fat, a large pillar. Uh, it was uh, very much represented in a time which now by law is not allowed anymore, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, where we can see the very different taboos in the Chinese art as compared to our art. Um, there were at the time exhibitions where you could see like a nude corpse of a woman. You would enter a room and you could walk around that corpse and uh, you would leave. And even censorship had gone through these rooms, but they have a very clear task. They don't know anything about art. They look for living politicians being represented. Maybe they look for intercourse, but uh, they wouldn't, you know, find something like a, a corpse or human fat, whatever, on that list of censorship. Um, this is another work by a, a young couple. It's about the old ideas that rule the world, represented by these old people. They do not necessarily represent a certain individual, but you know they stand for these ideas which very much rule the Western world and therefore also have a huge impact on the Chinese society. Uh, here is another work. Uh, it's called The Ten Mayors on the Grassland. They are actually these individuals in their 50s, a little bit overweight. These are the people that govern China today very self-asserted, uh, their expression. So it's a difficult work to show, but this is a work by a female artist executed on Second Life, which uh, though now sort of ends its life, but uh, it just is an indication that they play with all our media, our systems, with the web, etc. I think these were some images just to go through what the collection is and what uh, the history has been over time. Should I now quickly explain what happened to the collection? Is yes, that of the course, but first you have to, could you explain to us the idea that in fact you don't, you did not collect in function of your taste but you, want you wanted to embrace very, very large, to give kind of memory of what was going on in China from the 90s, right? So, 
uh, when I came to China again, end of the 70s, to establish what later became the first joint venture company between the outside world, I was trying to see another reality than the one I was allowed to see by the Chinese officials, by the party. I was always observed, accompanied. So I hope the Chinese contemporary art would give me another, another inroad to Chinese culture. That's why I started to look deeply into it, but as I mentioned earlier, didn't collect because I didn't find it interesting enough. But then <coughs> when I re say, reassessed the situation, at that time I was ambassador to China, North Korea and Mongolia. <laughs> I um, saw that nobody was collecting Chinese contemporary art not even in a remotely systematic way. And I thought this is a very odd. This is the biggest cultural space in the world, but nobody paying attention to what the Chinese contemporary artists were doing and how they were contributing to this society which was forming this contemporary society. So I decided to do what actually a national institution ought to do, to collect and built this document, which later would allow to illustrate what uh, Chinese art was, starting late 70s to today. But you, you already <coughs> had the idea to give one day the collection to a museum? Yeah, when I, when I realized what I just described, uh, I thought, OK, I will build this document, since nobody does it. But I uh, one day will give it to China. Ah. Yeah. So. So you wanted to give back what? In yeah, a way. Yeah, I, I felt, you know, when maybe the children in a few years will ask their parents, "What did our artists do in the 80s, 90s?" It cannot be found in China. So I felt somebody's got to do this, and but, that, but that you was are my Swiss. motive. But you are Swiss. I'm Swiss. That has been uh, also a. A dispute at times, can a foreigner do something like that? And uh, I also established an art award, an art critic award in China when the same topic resurfaced. You know, can I, as a foreigner, uh, sort of judge what's meaningful and not meaningful Chinese art? And these discussions um, maybe still exist to a degree, but basically the people have understood what the mission is, which I imposed myself on myself. Yeah, and being uh, so generous is something weird in a way, um, right? It may be weird, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and in a capitalist country, new yes, capitalist communist country. <laughs> yeah, so... So what did you decide to do with Hong Kong? Could you explain to us? Uh, so my idea was, as I said, to give it back, but while I collected, rather like an institution would, not like an individual would, not according to my taste, but as, as you said, uh, according to institutional type process. Um, I knew it would go back, but I didn't know when, I didn't know how, I didn't know where. And by uh, around 2010, 11, big Chinese institutions started to build huge museums or plan huge museums, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong and other cities. So I felt this is the moment, you know, to to make a plan and, and do the step where to allocate uh, the collection. So I negotiated with Beijing, Shanghai, Minister of Culture with Hong Kong. And I could see that Hong Kong would provide the best platform for such a collection. Uh, in Beijing, in Shanghai, a major reason was that I knew there is censorship. I was prepared to accept censorship to a degree, but I wanted to know what is it, to what degree does it go, uh, what are the rules. But nobody was in a position to fully explain to me censorship. And it could change. <coughs> it could, of course, change overnight. And. Uh, so I felt that Hong Kong, which at the time was planning this huge museum, bigger than the MoMA in New York, but didn't have a collection, didn't have anything yet in the museum, no content, 
uh, I felt this could be a very good platform for uh, the collection. Actually, about 45 million mainland Chinese travel to Hong Kong each year. So if you know Hong Kong, after two days shopping, <laughs> there is nothing else to do there. So I think a major institution, a museum of that type, they are building, will have a great future. And maybe even more mainland Chinese will see it there than could possibly see it in China. Bon, merci beaucoup.